I wanted to do a video just to give an update on how my first season of baling hay went. This is my first time ever baling, and if you watch some of the previous videos, you'll see some of the equipment that I purchased to uh, put up my hay. So I bought this round baler, which is a New Holland BR 740. It's got twine wrap on it. It doesn't use a net wrap. The K75C, which I did a review on, and I'm gonna do an update on this one too, just how it's uh, done so far. I put about 30 hours on it. And the Crone Active Mo R280 that I've been using. And last, uh, actually not lastly, but the little square baler here, the Super Liner, six, the Super Hay Liner 68 and the Tonuti five wheel rake. So this is three point mounted. And yeah, I wanted to do a update on how it all went. So I was able to get my hay put, put up. I got a hundred square bales out of this little square baler. And I've got 28 round bales that are pretty large, uh, five by four. I need to do some math on how much they weigh, but they're pretty, they're packed pretty tight. Um, my first time, I've never done this before, so I learned a lot. So let's start with some lessons learned on square baling. I had a video on refurbishing this whole square baler. I'm not gonna go into detail on how this thing works, but one thing that I did not do, which I should have, I, I was using the old twine that was in the twine bucket here. I kept having so many issues with the twine breaking because, and I couldn't figure out, I thought it was like a knotter issue or maybe the knotter knives were not working well. Um, and so I did a lot of just in the field, troubleshooting, jumping in and out of the tractor a lot. And it turned out it was just the twine was disintegrating as I was pulling it through. So I, I'm not even sure how old it was, but lesson number one, always use new twine, especially if you've got the sisal twine stuff that's biodegradable, it will degrade over time. So it will cause you a lot of problems if you don't start with new stuff. One other problem I had with square baling was I welded on this table for an outfeed and that really helped uh, keep the bales from kind of falling apart as they squish through here. However, I did learn something that I want to show you when I was welding. One of the angle irons, because what I did was I, here, I, I had two pieces of angle iron that I, uh, these are actually old posts um, from the garden. You can kind of see the little nub sticking out here for, you know, putting a fence on. So I just had two of these ran it in parallel with the bottom um, channel that that's adjustable for the bale tension and I just welded it onto the side of them and so and I was able to extend out and then I welded this table on top of those angles so if we go under here we can see one of the areas I was having trouble um, when the bale is pushing through this bale chamber the the string on it is actually kind of loose because it's it's getting squeezed through this bale chamber. So this is a look at the other side. The, the lighting's a little better over here, but the, the twine's not hanging down quite so much on this side. But when it does hang down, that angle that I had welded on had a sharp corner uh, right here. And so what I had to do, because I couldn't figure out what was going on, my um, twine kept snapping, and I thought it might be the knotters or something. And what was really happening was the this bale or this twine was getting stuck down around the angle. And when it had the 90 degree corner here, it was just cutting, cutting the twine. And so my bale just kept dumping out uh, the back um, as piles of hay. So when I figured that out, I just came and I took an angle grinder and I cut uh, roughly a 45 degree angle. It's kind of rounded. And then I smoothed this so it wouldn't snag and cut the twine again. So once I did that, I didn't have any issues, especially after I replaced the twine. Okay, so one other tip and lesson learned, and this really helped me determine my twine was bad. You can see these are like cams that the 
twine goes through to after the needle or, or the needles come up through they kind of thread the twine through this and then it rotates and um, that helps tie the knotters and everything so i won't go into detail this it's kind of complicated how this works but what happens is you'll notice um, if you have bad twine that this area here where the that twine comes through and you see on both sides here it will get really clogged up with twine so it will start to wrap around here and just kind of disintegrate as it gets rotated through so that's that'll be one clue that your twine is not good um, and you should have a lot of these little cuts here so when it does the knot and it makes the cut you'll have a lot of these little things and that's that's okay but if they're all clogged up in here that means that the twine's probably disintegrating um, as it's going through. So just a tip there to check your knotters if you're having trouble with a lot of your twine snapping. I'm still learning the bale tension I need because I was having so much trouble with the twine and that modification to my table to add the table that was breaking the twine. I, I thought it was like bale tension. So I'm still working on the bale tension. I actually think this needs to be, the bales need to be a little tighter. So. I'm probably going to crank these down a little bit, but just know in your first time bailing that this bale tension is a, it's more of an art than a science and you just have these cranks and you kind of have to play around a lot to figure out what's going to be the best tension for the twine you're using and the bales you're making and, and how long the bales are and how um, tight you want them to be. And the last two things that I'll share that I learned when I was using this old square baler is there's a clutch that will give way when the tines dig into the ground. So you'll need to play around with your height of your pickup here to not let it get too low. So that's another thing on your first time out, you're, you'll notice if the, the tines start really digging and sticking in and they may even stop um, altogether, you, you have to adjust the ride height and you may even have to adjust the clutch on the other side, which is right up here something that you'll have to um, play around with too if if you're having trouble with your your tines locking up so another lesson learned this uh, the bale twine chamber has a door on it and you lift it up to get access and then you usually close it down i actually found when i'm in the cab it's nice to have this thing open and the reason is you can't see the knotters on the other side over here when you're driving so if anything's going wrong you don't know about it until you know two or three bales are already not good a tip i found was when the plunger is going and it's feeding hay properly these will you'll see these uh this twine jump as it's getting pulled through these holes so having this door open um, allows you to see from your tractor cab these things getting pulled and so if they stop pulling then that means something happened with your knotters or you broke the twine or something's going wrong um, and you need to stop get out and address and fix it so you don't just keep dumping hay everywhere having hay bales that have one one piece of twine wrapped and the other one's broken and vice versa so that's another thing drive with this thing open i know there might get crud might get in there and stuff like that but to me i think it's worth it because it'll just save you time and you can fix your problems before you have bales disintegrating everywhere and you have to pick them up and put them back into windrows. One of the first things after mowing the hay that you need to do is you need to rake it into windrows and you can see by some of the drone footage I have that I didn't do a very good job of my first windrows and it's something too that you'll you'll get a feel for after you bail for the first time because the things that you notice are for your square bales this baler can't handle quite as much as the big round baler so you want smaller windrows it's it's a little more forgiving with the square baler your windrows like they can be more messy and and apart than on your big round baler because you don't have to worry about um, getting lopsided round bales and things like that in a square baler it's kind of just all smashes it in there and as long as a plenty of haze getting in you'll have a pretty nice square bale your windrows how tight they are and how uniform they are matters much more on the round baler than on the little square baler so the wheel rake is nice but a couple things you have to make sure are dialed in very well is one the angle of the 
the, the rake, um, sort of like how you angle a snow plow, you need to make sure that's right. So the steeper the angle, the smaller the windrows are going to be, uh, or the less hay is going to be in your windrows. The more shallow the angle, the more hay you're going to get in your windrows. And so if you have too much hay in your windrows, you've got to drive really slow with your tractor or it can overload the baler. So it's, it's sort of just something you have to remember is size of windrow and will affect the speed of your baling and your machine. Um, the other thing is the tilt of these five wheels here. You have to make sure they're all pretty well laying with the same amount of pressure on each wheel. Cause you can, it's real easy, especially with these three point hitch ones to have the weight tip on this front wheel, um, put too much weight on that. And then that far outside wheel comes up off the ground. And when that happens, you you leave hay behind and it, it sort of, uh, you have to go back and redo spots. So having all wheels consistently across the ground and consistent pressure is important so that you have, you rake cleanly. Last thing is just like having the float on your three point hitch is important with something like this. It's not a trailer mounted wheel rake. Um, you need to have it float because if you have hills or bumps or things like that, uh, you want the wheels to stay on the ground and not fly up in the air. And so my, my tractor has the float, so that's not a big issue. But if you don't have that ability with your three point, then a three point mounted wheel rake might be a challenge for you unless you have very flat fields. So lastly, on these wheel rakes, speed matters. And I found the faster you go, the better they work. The sweet spot for me in my fields with, mine are pretty bumpy and hilly, um, was about between nine and 10 miles per hour. So I found that when I went that fast, they really turn and they really pick up the hay nicely. So if, the, if you're not getting good results, try going a little faster with your wheel rake. So a big thing, if you've got a smaller tractor without a lot of weight to it, I mean, horsepower in most tractors today are is more than you need to run most attachments and things. It's, it's really just you have enough weight to handle the stuff. One example of the weight you need to really kind of act as ballast is when you're using three point mounted things that are heavy that aren't pulling behind on a trailer, like that cutter, you need front weight to keep the front end down when you lift that thing up on the back. And so, I have a loader on this tractor and I actually had to bucket on when I was mowing. Um, so that just helps me one, keep more weight on the tractor and two, offset that extra weight that's on the back that wants to lift the front wheels up. So I have to admit, the thing I was most terrified of when I first started baling the, this year was the round baler. I mean, this thing is like a mobile factory. They're huge. You can see how big it is next to my little tractor here. And one thing to know is this baler is a, considered a small one. So a small round baler. I got about the smallest round baler I, I could find that would work with a 75 horsepower tractor. And this one actually worked, worked great with the tractor. The tractor had plenty of power, but these things are big. Uh, they're very heavy. This thing weighs about 6,000 pounds. And then when they're filled, filled with the bale, they can, that can add another thousand to even 1500 pounds into that baler. So you're, you're pulling a lot. And, this tractor only weighs like eight or 9,000 pounds. Um, so you're, you end up pulling more than the tractor weighs. Now with the loader and everything, I think I'm about 10,000 pounds with, with the tractor. But I was terrified of this thing because I had gone through it. I greased everything. I replaced tines underneath. I replaced the tire on the side. And every job on this thing is just big. I was a little worried. I had belts new belts that I ordered. I didn't put them on though because I wanted to run through my first set of bales before I did new belts and test them out and that way if there's anything wrong you know I wouldn't mess up a new belt. This thing was the most intimidating thing and it was also the most critical because I ended up getting 28 bales and that's going to be pretty close to everything we need to get through the winter for the 10 cows that we have. We don't have a whole bunch of cows um, and we're, we should get one to two more cuts out of the field. So we should have more than enough hay in round bales to feed our cows. But this thing had to work and I never run it. And the, the things that gave me the most trouble, one was just getting this thing hooked up. Um, it's, 
it's a very heavy thing. It doesn't move easy. And this PTO shaft was the biggest problem. So it had a lot of gunk in there and the paint was peeling and it was getting stuck. And so I couldn't slide it easy to push it onto the tractor on the PTO shaft. So that actually took me about an hour to get this thing cleaned enough and greased enough. And I had to scrape off paint and do lots of stuff to even, I had to have a helper come and help me turn the shaft up up a little higher underneath there to get the splines lined up because you, you can't turn this with your hand to get the splines lined up. So it's, if you either get lucky and they're perfectly in line or you need like some help to turn this thing because it's really hard to, to turn this even a little bit. So this thing right here caused me a lot of headache too. It's the auto wrap computer that came with the baler. And so what it does is it basically just tells you when the bale is, uh, the baler's full and you know, your bale's complete and then it starts the wrap process. So when, you know, it should emit a beep and then let you know that you have to stop and back up and open the tail end to let the bale out after the wrapping's complete. Um, the other thing this thing does is it should tell you, you can see the arrows here on this bale, your bale density on both sides. So what you wanna do is there's these, it's a little bar graph that goes up, two little bar graphs that are on each side and they tell you like density and, and there's plenty of videos on how these things work. Well, this thing is not working. So it turns on and it makes a beep, um, but it doesn't actually tell you how dense your bale is on either side. So I wasn't able to, to use that. And there's some visibility issue with this baler where you can't really see the bale very well. So it's hard to tell. So I just kind of had to uh, zigzag as much as I could with the tractor and try to guesstimate how dense my bales were. Um, but I need to work on this and get the sensors fixed because something's not communicating well. But the other thing too is when I first, my very first bale, um, as I was baling with this thing, it was, it was picking up the hay. Everything was working great. I watched the bale meter keep getting more and more full and the bale meter is up here and you can see it from the cab. It's on the right side there. Um, as that arrow goes up and up and up, it means the bale's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So I was watching it and it got, it kept going, going, going. And I, I just wanted to wait and listen for that auto wrap thing to make a beep to tell me that it was full. Whenever well, beeped and I, I kind of was watching and I did notice that this, this thing here, which is your wrap indicator telling you if the wrapping process is starting. So what this does is this will jump up in the air once the um, bale is full and it trips the auto wrap feature, it'll jump up. And then that means if you don't have the bale uh, wrap, the wrap um, computer in your cab, you just have to watch this. And as soon as that jumps up, that tells you to stop. So then it starts the wrapping process and it wraps the bale with all the twine. And then as it's wrapping, it drops slowly, slowly, slowly. And then it hits down to where these scissors are. And that means the cut was made and then you can eject the bale out the back and st keep bailing. The other thing is when, when it is wrapping, these pulleys here are spinning. So if you see them spinning, you know that your twine is going out and there's the, the twines on, on both sides. So you'll see those pulleys spinning. So as it's spinning, you don't wanna bale anymore. Well, my first bale, I didn't really know all this stuff because I do have a service manual for this, but I didn't really have an operator manual and I couldn't find one reasonably online uh, and I didn't really see any information on you know kind of the stupid question how do you know when the bale's done and how do you eject it and all these things and I found that this thing did move I didn't hear the beep but it did move and it was wrapping but I kept going um, and I was just still waiting for it to beep and I'm like something's got to be wrong here so what I did is I got out and I knew from my service manual that this lever here, when you push that down, you can manually start the wrap process yourself. I'm kind of embarrassed by this now, but I, I tripped that and I started a wrap process myself. So basically I had a bale wrapped. I had it then more hay packed around it. And then I started the wrap process again. And I didn't really know how long the wrap process takes, but it takes 
this thing was set up to wrap it 24 times and it, it takes a good 15 to 20 seconds to do the whole wrap process, maybe even 30 seconds. I just basically shut it down, started going and I let the bail out after I turned the PTO off when it wasn't complete with the wrap wrapping job here. And I had twine extending from the baler to the the bale. So my first bale was a mess. It was a tightly wrapped bale that then had a bunch of junk around it, a bunch more hay wrapped, but then a couple of loops of twine wrapped around again, and then a big snag into the baler and stuff. And it was a, it was a big mistake on my part. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. So then I had to re-thread everything with the twine underneath here. And it's actually, it, it's intimidating to wrap this or to thread all this twine back but it's really pretty straightforward when you get under here and you look but on my second bale i managed to get lucky and wrap this fine and get it back to where the cutter is um, and then on the other side i did not get it configured right um, and so my second bale i was paying more attention the wrap went i let it finish and then I ejected the bale and then only half the bale was wrapped with twine. So that was a fail too on my second bale. Um, and then I played around and I got everything kind of back and up and running again um, and, and threaded correctly. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, once I did that, I didn't have any more problems all day long. So this thing did awesome. This is kind of a tough angle to see um, but there are these arms that the twine is is laced through. So if you're not familiar with how a round bale works, uh, round baler works, this is threaded through, and then at the end of these arms, there's sort of this spring tensioned um, bolt that the the twine goes through the end. You have to like push the bolt out, and it goes through the end, and then it kind of just the bolt comes back in with the spring tension and it holds this from getting pulled back in or pulled out um, too easily. So it does provide some tension, but um, this down here, let me change my angle here. Um, when, when it goes through that end of that arm, there's a cutter bar here that sort of, you can open it up um, when you pull that lever I was talking about to start the auto wrap yourself, what it does is it, it lifts this cutter up. Um, and so when you do that, if the thing's been working properly, this goes loose then. It just hang, dangles down. And I thought, because um, with, with the square baler, you don't really want the thing dangling after you re-thread it, um, re-thread the twine through the needlers, you tie them off onto the frame of the tractor um, otherwise they won't get pulled through. So the difference with a round baler is this has to hang free. So if you find yourself having to re-thread re your twine because you made a mistake like I did or something happened or you broke twine or whatever, um, the easiest way to get everything back to working again is to thread it through the ends here. And again, you have to push this bolt out um, and then just uh, manually trip your First, make sure you have some hay in there, but then manually trip that lever. And then just make sure this is threaded through and it's dangling down about, I don't know, six to eight inches. Um, but it won't, it won't get caught in this um, and you shouldn't really be uh, picking up hay if you're, if you're doing this, but you just let it hang. And then what happens is these arms right here, this, these arms, they rotate the two of them, they rotate and they come together way, I adjust my camera here. So what happens is the, the arms rotate and then they come, they go like this and they come together and they put that loose hanging twine right by the bale and it gets sucked in into the bale there and then wrapped around. And all it does is just the bale spins and it just keeps feeding this twine and wraps the bale up and then the arms retract and then this um, bar rotates and brings the knives down and it cuts, cuts your twine. And then that signals the end of the wrapping process. And so then the next time 
um, it'll, it'll look like this. It won't be dangly. It'll be caught between the knife and, um, you know, this plate here. So it'll be tensioned. But when I was first putting this, uh, tying this all back up, I thought I had to tie this off somewhere and I tied it off. And so um, that caused me a lot of headache because you don't need to tie it off. Um, if you have to rethread it, you just let it dangle. Um, so that's just a tip because I, I didn't know that. And I finally just figured it out um, by looking at my service manual enough and realizing how it worked. After I figured out all of the things that were causing me issues with the wrapping process, the, the only other real big issue I had with the round baler was how this, this pin, so I have a really long pin and when it's, when this thing's mounted on the tractor, it hangs down really low. Um, and then once the cotter pins in, it, it really grabs a lot of hay and it, it sort of pushes through the windrow and it catches a bunch of hay and then you start to get a big pile up underneath the back of the tractor. So I'd have to, I'd have to reverse to get it unclogged. But I think the next time I bail, I'm going to want to get a smaller pin that hangs down less and maybe try to change the height. I, I can probably, you know, do something to change the height on the back of my tractor to keep this tongue up off the ground more so it's not grabbing hay. The only other issue I had with this baler that I had to fix before it was perfectly functional. Um, so I replaced the tire, I re replaced a lot of um, pickup tines, and uh, really the only other thing that caused me issues when I tested out the hydraulics for the first time, the hydraulics lift the back um, door up here and let the bail out. When I was testing it, I lifted the door up and I let it sit there and it you know, kind of puts a lot of pressure back on the hydraulics. and Normally, there's these compression hose, hoses here. This, they're like um, metal, metal um, pipes that they use on, on a lot of you know, hydraulic equipment instead of these hoses. As, as these pipes wind through the machine, you can see what I did here. Uh, this one goes all the way through to the other side and around to the other cylinder, but this pipe had gotten rusted underneath in this lip here underneath that goes across because it's it's an area that can trap moisture um, and so this this pipe was rusted and it looked like someone had tried to solder it together at some point but at that solder joint they blew out and I had hydraulic um, fluid spraying so all I did um, I was kind of in a pinch so I just went and got a a hose a hydraulic hose that was about 15 feet long you probably should on this baler should have had like a 17 footer, um, would have been just about perfect. And I, I just attached it where that compression thing was at and snaked it through and went to the other side. And that took care of my problem because to me, I, I thought that was easier than trying to get this hose all pulled out and re, you know, bent. And uh, I, I just think working with this stuff is harder than with the hose. If you're going to farm or do anything with big equipment, you should definitely invest in a grease gun. Um, I use this DeWalt 20 volt max grease gun here. Uh, and I can put a link to it, but this thing has saved me so much time because on these, I mean, excavators are the worst for having grease, greasable joints. There's joints everywhere on these things. Um, and you really have to keep them grease well. Skid steers have them, but these balers have a lot too. And the nice thing about the balers, uh, this baler, is there are these remotes, so you don't have to climb up to every you know bearing point up there. The the grease gets fed up to them, so you don't have to climb ladders or anything like that. And then they they're brought down to these um, little junction points here. But there's a lot of greasing to do for the baler. It's it's something you should definitely get if you're going to get into farming or into using big equipment. And, you know, once you start adding up all of your attachments and machines that have greasable points, uh, you really will save yourself a lot of time by getting a grease gun. So, yeah, after 32 hours of ownership of this Case 75C, I am impressed with everything. 
and I'm um, very impressed with just how well, how clean it stays, even when you're doing, you know, hay work and stuff. It, it you don't have like every everything's up front, so you don't have to worry about um, things getting clogged too too bad. Uh, I still have to go and clean out the radiators and stuff like that after um, doing hay, but. Yeah, so far this has been a really good machine, and I think if I were to change anything after 32 hours, is maybe a hydrostatic transmission for this thing, because I thought I might like the gears, and maybe I'll come around to them, especially if I start doing more like planting vegetables and things like that, where I need to crawl around at slow speed. I'll probably like the gears then, but as of right now with hay, I feel like a hydro static transmission would probably be better. So just FYI, the, and this is my take, again, after not a long-term review, but more of a mid-term review here of this thing. But I don't regret the purchase, and I'm really happy with it. I think I had higher hopes for the skid steer mount on the front and how easy it would be to put attachments on and off. And then the, the geared transmission, it's just a lot of, you know, shifting, clutch work, things like that, trying to match speeds with ground conditions and attachments and all that, where I feel like if I just had a hydro static transmission, I could just, you know, speed up, slow down without having to worry about changing in engine RPMs and things like that. So something to know if you're gonna do hay and you want a good tractor, maybe think of hydro. Uh, if, if that's completely wrong, please tell me because I, again, I am not an expert at this. I'm just learning as I go. And this has been a very steep learning curve to get all these machines sort of up and running and you know learning how they all work and they're man reading their manuals and servicing them and all the stuff and especially like 60 year old machines giant machines all these things are a little intimidating and just learning when to cut hay and when to bale it moisture conditions it, it's a it's a tall hill to climb if you don't come from a farming family and you haven't learned this stuff growing up so definitely Kudos to all those who do this and make it look easy because it's certainly not easy. It's a lot of work and it is very satisfying and I'm happy I'm doing it now. If you don't have experience farming or ever doing hay before, you can do it. Just uh, be prepared to monkey around on machines for a while and put up, put up a bunch of capital to, you know, harvest some hay. So it's, it's not, it's, just because you buy the machines doesn't mean that you automatically have hay in the barn you you still have to go out and do the work and make sure everything's running well so just consider all that before you dive into making your own hay but if you do um, hopefully you've learned a few things on your first your first time uh, venturing into your hay enterprise so thanks everybody for watching